Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined again by Dr. Sander van der Linden. He is Professor of Social Psychology at the University of Cambridge and Director of the Cambridge Social Decision Making Lab. And today we're going to focus on his book, Foolproof, Why Misinformation Infects Our Minds and How to Build Immunity. So, Dr. van der Linden, welcome back to the show. It's a huge pleasure to have you on. Pleasure to be back on the show. So, uh, I mean, this might, uh, might sound a bit redundant because of the conversation we had last time, but I, I think it's important in the context of your book to really start with perhaps a few definitions and also particularly because you distinguish between, for example, misinformation and disinformation. So what's uh, exactly the distinction there? Yeah, or at least the distinction that I make in the book is that, you know, misinformation can be any information that's either false or misleading, um, regardless of intent. Uh, and disinformation really is a bit more nefarious in the sense that it's specifically produced with the intention to deceive or harm other people. And so that's really the key distinction. But, you know, as I know in the book, legally, it's so difficult to establish intent. Mm -hmm. And um, so there are, there are numerous examples that are well documented that have been the subject of court hearings where, you know, where it's been established that this has been disinformation because it was planned in advance. And the goal was to do people and there's evidence of that. So in the book, I speak about disinformation when when there's really evidence of, of intent and otherwise I'll just refer to it as as misinformation, which can be any information that's that's false or misleading. And I should add that, you know, in most people's definition, misinformation is just information that's false as determined by by fact checkers or something like that. But I adopt a slightly broader definition to include content that is not only that may not be 100% false, but could be seriously misleading. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to say that it is really on the rise across media, the internet, and so on? Because that's the claim put forth by many people out there. Some of them talk even about the post-truth era, for example. Yeah, I think the, the idea of post-truth really is that... Uh, you know, that we have more access to information than ever before, but somehow people seem to cling on to their own special set of beliefs and information diets. And it seems to be a paradox that even that you could easily fact check something, lots of people have beliefs that aren't necessarily fact based. And I do think that that's, you know, partly a product of, of the way that we've restructured the flow of information in society, including more fragmented information diets as as a function of social media. Um, but it's 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 a tough question. I do think that there's more misinformation now. It's there's a lot of production of it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, it's being spread widely um, and being consumed widely. But I guess you have to put it in historic context. I guess my counter question would be, you know, and as I mentioned this in the book as well, you know, relative to what period. So, you know, I think relative to, to some time ago, maybe 10, 20 years ago, we're seeing a lot of misinformation now. Um, but, you know, if you compare it to, let's say, World War II, there was a lot of propaganda during the war as well, right? Um, in the medieval ages, people were burning witches at the stake because of conspiracy theories, right? So we've always had it. Um, but I do think that what you see is this fluctuation that whenever there's societal unrest, when things are not going so well economically, socially, politically, it just creates a huge market for misinformation, both in terms of demand uh, and supply which is now aided by a new technology that can personalize and spread that content much more efficiently than what we've seen before. So I think that interaction is new um, and that also creates a lot more exposure for, for people. And I, I will say that exposure doesn't always equal quote unquote infection when using mm -hmm. the viral analogy. So I do think we have a lot more exposure at the moment. And the question is, does that also lead to, to more people being duped? And that's, you know, that's actively debated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll get toward the end of the interview into what you call the vaccine in your yeah. book. So, uh, but uh, do we know if there's really more misinformation online than on traditional media? And is it that it spreads easier there or not? 
Yeah, we do know that, you know, to some extent, we know that the, the types of news that people consume via social media are more low quality. So if you look at uh, sources like NewsGuard, which rates website in terms of their trustworthiness, we know that, you know, a lot of what you see on social media is is low, low quality and, and, and low trustworthy content in terms of news that's being shared. Um, we do know that misinformation spreads on social media. There are some studies that show that misinformation can spread faster, further and deeper than factual information on social media. Um, kind of, you know, like the old saying, uh, a lie can make its way, you know, around the world before the truth has had its chance to, to, to put its pants on. Um, and that, I think, is partly enabled by social media. Um, you know, there's some other studies that show that, you know, it depends on the type of social media, it depends on the context. And so it's not always the case that you see this viral diffusion everywhere all the time. But certainly the the structural properties of social media, you know, the way that, that it connects people allows for that type of spread to, to happen. Uh, but that isn't to say that legacy media isn't isn't completely innocent. I mean, a lot of misinformation spreads via cable news. Uh, that's traditionally been the case in terms of, you know, what used to be called an, an echo chamber could be, you know, traditional media as well in terms of people just watching one or two news channels. And especially in countries like the United States, where you have a very fractured partisan uh, news media system where, where people only tune in to, to their preferred channels, that can also create a, uh, an echo chamber, you know, albeit offline. And so that's certainly not to be underestimated. Um, one of the things that's really important when it comes to the spread of misinformation is that when non-credible outlets spread fake news, that's, that's one thing. But when very trusted outlets, you know, either accidentally or intentionally spread misinformation, that can often generate much more traction because people trust those outlets. And so I, I give a few examples uh, in the book, you know, not to undermine mainstream media because, you know, by and large, they're producing more and more quality content. But the New York Times coverage of the, you know, weapons of mass destruction during the Iraq war were, was, you know, uh, untrustworthy, to say the least. Uh, BBC has had a long policy of propping up con climate contrarians in, in the debates. And both outlets, the difference is that both outlets have apologized for that and trying to do a better job, whereas a lot of the low quality outlets obviously aren't doing that. Their purpose is just to, to do people more or less. But it can be very dangerous for legacy media to repeat misinformation. Mm -hmm. And how susceptible are people to misinformation? Because, of course, it's really simple for us to just say that people are stupid and gullible. But that doesn't seem to be really the case or the best explanation out there for it, right? Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, there's certainly a group of uh, people or scholars, you know, who kind of assume that, you know, what's happening is that, that people are biased, that people are lazy and that they're being duped and they see that as the main explanation. So, you know, the, the, this is called the, the, you know, the, the lazy account. And so people are not, they're on social media, they're not paying attention, they're bombarded with too much information. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we end up sharing misinformation because we don't have the cognitive capacity to discern carefully between all of the different kinds of information, the you know, sources that are coming at us. Um, you know, other people say, well, you know, people are actually quite smart, they're quite educated. You know, most people are not extreme. Most people are not politically active. Um, you know, most of our media, media diet is actually pretty diverse. Um, and so, you know, it's not the case that, that people are gullible. Um, and uh, then still other people say, oh, well, you know, what, what's happening is that people know very well um, what's going on. They're intentionally spreading false information because it bolsters their group identity, right? It bolsters the types of narratives that they want to be true about the world, that they want to be true uh, about the other side that they might not like. And so there's religious, spiritual, social, and political motives that lead people to share misinformation. And I think, and what I try to do in the book is kind of say, well, you know, a lot of these things are not mutually exclusive. I think, yeah, we, we do have too much information at, in a sense, and people are being bombarded. Uh, which kind of reduces our capabilities to respond uh, and discern in an effective way. But people are also motivated by social and political identities uh, and issues that, that get us riled up and that get us, you know, uh, wanting to endure certain narratives over others. And so I think both are true at the, at the same time. Um, and then there's, you know, there are certain cognitive mechanisms that are pretty universal. Um, so you ask who's susceptible. And one of the things I think that is underestimated is that, 
we are all susceptible because we all share the same basic brain structure uh, that is can be exploited systematically uh, in certain ways. So we know that when information is repeated consistently, um, the brain tends to create a signal um, for repeated information in the sense that it becomes more familiar. And so it's easier for the brain to process. Um, and so if something is easier to process, we say that it's more fluent. Um, and the more fluent it is, the more likely the brain is to think that it's true. So we know that two times two is four because we've rehearsed it, it's quick, it's easy. But unfortunately, the same is true for, for narratives that are false. You could easily create similar associations. Um, and that can, dupe, that can dupe anyone. And that's sort of called the illusory truth. And the illusory truth, you know, research has shown that um, you know, up to 75% or something like that, up to 75% of people show some evidence of illusory truth, including children. Mm -hmm. And prior knowledge doesn't even help that much. And so if I tell you, so, so let's, you know, let's do a test, Ricardo. So I tell you, you know, oh, there's a lot of people that live in Madrid. You know, Madrid is a city in Spain. It's, it's the largest city in Europe, really. It's very populous. Most people live in, in, in Madrid, in Europe. It's a city in Spain, and, and there's a lot of people in, in Madrid. Huge, huge city, most populous city in, in Europe. A few days later, I tell you, Oh, that was actually nonsense. Madrid isn't the largest city, uh, most popular city in, in Europe. Um, what happens is that people continue to, to retrieve that information from memory because it's been repeated um, and because it's become familiar and because it's easier to, to access. And so that is kind of the idea of illusory truth and also this idea of the continued influence of, of misinformation that, you know, once you've been exposed to it, um, even when you encounter a correction, people continue to retrieve false details from, from memory, and that's a very robust finding. And, and everyone can, can be susceptible to that, no matter what your politics are. So I think there are certain features of the human brain that make everyone susceptible, but then there's also other motives that make certain groups either more targeted or, or more susceptible um, because of you know, what they believe or the, the politics that they endorse. And when it comes to the groups, uh, uh, different groups are more or less susceptible to different kinds of misinformation depending on, for example, their social and political affiliations, correct? Correct, yeah. And certain, you know, certain misinformation is designed to play into group divisions, right? And mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, for example, you might see an article that, uh, that writes negatively about liberals or conservatives or, vi or vice versa, and that is just designed to, to play into the people's group divisions. And so the, when people encounter it, and it, it looks like an opportunity to sort of dunk on the other side because it's, you know, it, it's a narrative that, that kind of bolsters your, your pre-existing beliefs, then it's easy for people to click and, and share that information. And so, um, yeah, and so, you know, different types of misinformation feed into, into, into different kinds of issues. But then there's also the idea that sometimes misinformation is targeted at specific groups. So there's a lot of uh, Russian disinformation that, you know, for example, during the election was, uh, was targeted uh, racially because they were trying to create race divisions during the elections. And so a lot of it was about black Americans, for example. And so misinformation can be targeted towards certain groups. Um, and then it becomes, you know, more difficult to disentangle whether certain groups are more likely to believe misinformation because there's something about their group psychology or about, or, you know, about their, the individual psychology of people who belong to that group, or is it because they're more heavily targeted in the current information environment and ju they're just more likely to be exposed to it? Mm -hmm. uh do we know if there's any demographic that is more susceptible to misinformation? Because people kind of have this stereotype that older people, because they are not from, let's say, the internet age, they don't navigate it as well as younger people, or at least, of course, people, younger people have navigated it for a longer time and they know more about it, but mm. that doesn't necessarily translate into uh, dealing well, uh, dealing better with the information they are presented there. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a popular question. People often ask me, like, okay, what's you know, what demographic is most susceptible to, to misinformation? And you know, it kind of works like a FBI profiling exercise, right? That there's there's a general sketch of the type of individual, but obviously it's not going to be true in all cases. But I, I do think a lot of research shows some commonalities of the types of individuals that are more likely to be to be susceptible to, to misinformation. It typically tends to be people who spend who get most of their news from social media, people who are politically more extreme, 
people who are dogmatic, so they're less flexible and less open-minded, mm -hmm. people who are more intuitive in their thinking versus analytical, people who tend to have lower literacy, numeracy, and education levels, um, and uh, you know, people who often maybe who might feel marginalized in society or they feel they have lack of agency or, or control um, or feel powerless. Um, which makes them more likely to endorse conspiracy theories, for example. Um, and so yeah, there's a sort of whole range of variables that when you put them together, that makes for a more susceptible individual. The age one is interesting because some research shows that people who are older are more likely to either believe or spread misinformation, maybe partially because they're less, uh, they're not, as you said, digital natives. Um, mm -hmm. But then there's other research, for example, on, on the, in the context of COVID, we found that the opposite was true. And I don't know, maybe that's because Older people are more susceptible to, to, to COVID harm and COVID risks. And so perhaps they're discerning more because it's more relevant to them. And so they were actually less likely to spread uh, misinformation about or believe misinformation about COVID. So there are some interesting nuances. Um, and the reason why older people are more susceptible is also kind of debated. Um, you know, one hypothesis is that they're, you know, not not necessarily as digitally literate. Another it has to do with cognitive decline. Uh, but then there are some other research that shows that older people can actually discern better um, because they have better capabilities and resources. So it's kind of an open question in terms of the the age factor. And I will say that there's a, a little bit in my book called the, a section called the kids aren't all right, which also show that, you know, teenagers are susceptible to being duped. Um, and so, yeah, it's not entirely clear to me uh, that older versus younger people are more susceptible because they have lower digital skills. I think it is true that some elderly individuals are more easily duped online because you know they're they're, they're less able to recognize uh, what's going on on social media or what certain types of scams or, or perhaps misinformation. Um, but that can also be true for younger audiences. And so it's you know there, there's a little bit it's a little bit more nuanced. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, in the book, you talk about this concept of fluency. Uh, what is it and how does it apply in the context of understanding how misinformation works or spreads? Yeah, fluency is really important. It's sort of this idea that it's about the ease with which we process information. So information that runs contrary to your beliefs is not very fluent because it creates friction. It creates sort of a, you know, you're like, hey, wait, I thought this was true. Now you're telling me this. And it creates kind of a reflection and, and what we call a bit of friction. Um, fluency coheres in a way with, with what you already believe, but it can also be created out of repetition. So the more you repeat something, the more familiar it becomes and the easier it is for your brain to process. And so it becomes more fluent. And the, the, the idea of fluency uh, is really that the brain is just more likely to think that something is true when it's processed more fluently. Um, and so misinformation producers can take advantage of this by just continually repeating false narratives because the repetition makes it easier for the brain to process. And research shows that not only does it make people more likely to think that something is true if it's been repeated, but also that it's less immoral to share. And so some research shows that, you know, if you hear a false narrative a lot of times, initially you might think that it's morally dubious, but after repeated exposure, you actually don't find it that morally problematic anymore. And so people are perhaps more likely to share it. So there are all these interesting mechanisms that that um, are actually a product of, of, of repetition and, and fluency. And so in the book, I say that that's a bad thing in the sense that they can take advantage of this by just continually um, repeating false narratives and, and something called the, uh, I quote, uh, there's a propaganda quote in there from the um, Reich's minister uh, in Germany during World War II, Goebbels, who you know talks about the the big lie that uh, um, that his the, the psychology of that for him was very interesting. It was actually Hitler who first, who first wrote about it, but the idea was that um, people are not going to notice outrageous lies because they won't think that somebody would come up with something that ridiculous if it weren't true, and so it must be true if it if it's crazy. And the more, you know, the more you repeat it, the, the more likely it seems to, to be true. And, and uh, Nazi propaganda was a big fan of repetition. And that's also partly of why, um, why it was um, so effective. Um, and so this concept of fluency is really, really important. Um, and yeah, and so in the book, I try to talk about how we can harness that in the service of truth. Um, and so in a way, we need to make the truth more fluent by repeating it, by making it easily digestible, 
you know, misinformation is always simple and, and, and structured and, and easy, whereas science is complex and nuanced. And so we have to try to find ways to make the truth fluent. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing for us to have our beliefs or in Bayesian terms, our priors. And when we are exposed to information that sort of confirms them, we reinforce them in a way. But what happens when we are exposed to contradictory information? Do people really update their priors? Is the brain in any way Bayesian or not? Yeah, so this is another huge and uh, really interesting debate. I mean, some some scholars believe that the brain kind of is a Bayesian, so that, you know, you walk around the world with priors, uh, so prior beliefs about the likelihood of various things, and then you come across evidence and then you update. Um, and the, uh, you know, a, a classical example is that, you know, you might you might not realize that uh, touching a hot, a hot stove is a bad thing, right? And then you put your finger on the hot stove and you burn it and you realize the hard way um, that, uh, you know, irrefutable evidence um, <laughs> that there's pain involved and so you update your beliefs. and. And it feels kind of natural to a lot of scholars to think that the brain operates this way, almost like a scientific experiment that, you know, we have our hypotheses, we collect evidence and we update. Um, but then the post-truth era has kind of suggested that that's not at all how people operate in the sense that, well, um, you know, people are motivated to process information in a way that, that fits with what they already want to believe. Um, and so an example that I give is, is from Sean Spicer during Trump's uh, inauguration that, you know, he said the largest inauguration ever. Then people told him oh, that that wasn't exactly true. Uh, and then he just doubled down on his beliefs. So he updated away from the evidence. Um, and that and that's kind of the, the thing that people are thinking about now that, you know, this idea of belief polarization, that if you expose people to evidence, they polarize away from the evidence even further so that people end up further away from each other than when they started. And that the whole idea is that evidence, you know, is, is useless, uh, useless in uh, in, in trying to get people to update. And in the book, I kind of take the stance that I think that what, if you look at this literature closely, and we, you know, we did this recently with, uh, with a lot of scholars in the field, we, we kind of revisited all of these studies. And I think the more, the better conclusion is that most of the time people do update their beliefs in response to, to evidence, but there are situations and there are people who might display contrarian tendencies. Um, and so these are people who tend to be more politically extreme, who are less open minded, uh, and they tend to be fewer in terms of the, the population. But when you zoom in, um, that's where you can find evidence of, of, of belief polarization. But when you look at the average among large groups of people, there's where you see that most people are reasonable and, and update uh, away uh, or update towards the, the evidence. And I describe an experiment on climate change in the book where this kind of illustrate this and so one experiment we did uh, where, you know, there's all of this talk that in the United States, you know, yeah. people don't believe in climate change. And and if you show people evidence, they will just get more polarized. But what's interesting is when we looked at the experiment at the beginning, we did find that, you know, people and this is a very politicized debate. So in the US, conservatives are less likely to believe in climate change than, than liberals. Um, and this 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 sort of motivated numeracy hypothesis suggests that, oh, actually, the the more the smarter people are, the more literate, the more numerate they are, the better they are at interpreting evidence in a motivated way because they, they're very clever. So they can twist around the facts to, to fit their worldview. And it's, it's kind of a funny hypothesis. It's interesting. Um, and so what we find was that, yeah, the most educated um, conservatives were even less likely to endorse the scientific consensus on climate change uh, than, than, than regular conservatives before they were exposed to evidence. And so that signals to me that people do come to the table with prior motivations. But then when we expose people to the facts, what we found was that everyone updated their beliefs that most scientists actually agree that climate change is happening. And the more educated and the more literate you were, the more likely you were to update your beliefs. And I think that kind of signals that, you know, both accounts are probably true, that people do carry around these sort of political and social beliefs about the world, but people are, that doesn't necessarily mean that people are unwilling to reconsider their positions and, and update their beliefs when they encounter, encounter new evidence. Because an alternative hypothesis, um, is not that people are motivated to reject the truth, but that they find themselves in, in online or offline echo chambers and are selectively exposed to one kind of information and they, and they just don't come across diverse 
uh, sources of evidence. And when you expose them, they're happy to, to reconsider their position. And so I don't think that everyone does that, but I think most reasonable people do. Uh, and then there's a group of people who might not do that. Uh, and they might polarize away, and that's a, a much smaller group of people than um, than the average population. I think that's kind of the more nuanced answer. Mm -hmm. But you um, reference there the correlation that there uh, there is between intelligence and susceptibility to misinformation. But is it really that statistically speaking, smarter people? seem to be more susceptible to misinformation. I mean, by smarter, it, it can mean different things, perhaps uh, like uh, just intelligence IQ or being more educated, having more knowledge. I, I mean, is there really that correlation? Well, there were, there were some studies that showed, uh, prominent studies that showed that they were correlational that showed, yeah, the more literate, the more numerate, and the more educated people are, the more polarized they are on things like vaccines and climate change and GMOs. Um, and I was always a bit skeptical of that because it kind of defies the whole purpose of education. It kind of suggests that education, you know, doesn't make people more open-minded and so on and just polarizes people and this that didn't strike me as, as as very accurate and i think you know a ton of studies have now shown that when you actually test these correlations in an experimental sense that when you expose you know people with higher and lower numeracy skills to to information on, on contested issues you don't see that they that they polarized you see that they in fact um update their beliefs more than people who don't have those skills so i think i think the general consensus is that you know, whatever indicator you have of intelligence or literacy or numeracy, that more of it actually helps people uh, protect themselves against misinformation rather than make them more susceptible. I think that there's a few studies that, that kind of show the opposite, that it makes people more susceptible, but broadly they seem hard to replicate. And that's not what most studies are now finding in an, in an experimental sense. So I think, again, it comes back to maybe that's true for a minority of people who are extreme, but that, that's not really what's, what's happening for most people. Okay. So one of the topics you tackle in the book that has to do, of course, also with misinformation is conspiracy theories and conspiratorial thinking. So what is special about that kind of misinformation, psychologically speaking? Yeah, conspiracy theories are really interesting because they purport themselves to, to almost be like a scientific theory, but but they're not. And so they're kind of a, a more, well, some are ridiculous, but but a lot of them are slightly more sophisticated forms of misinformation because they dress themselves up, they dress themselves up as, um, as a legitimate theory. Um, and they really resonate with people because of the way they tap into, I think, human psychology. So conspiracy theories fulfill important psychological motives for people. Um, some of them are what we call epistemic motives. So they, they kind of um, quench people's uh, thirst for knowledge. So they give simple explanations for what otherwise seem to be complex and random events. So they draw very simple causal relationships uh, and assume that uh, one thing is causing another and that people are operating behind the scenes. Um, they serve relational motives, and that's a very important one. Um, so they connect people uh, who otherwise feel marginalized and out of the loop. They feel they're not being heard. They, you know, they, they have the truth and other people are just mindless sheeple duped by the mainstream media, right? Uh, and so they connect people who feel marginalized and they provide a sense of affiliation and community for people. And then the third is, uh, is, is um, um, existential, that a lot of people worry about the future. It's chaotic, it's uncertain. And so they provide a sense of relief for people uh, by, off, you know, it, it's scary to think about global warming. So it's much easier to believe a theory that says it's not real and that we shouldn't worry about it. So they provide a sense of psychological relief. Um, and those three motives are are really what make them quite attractive to um to, to people yeah and so that that's why i think what what makes it special um and also the fact that trying to that conspiracy theories often like uh they operate like a monological belief system or or a multi-level marketing scheme is another way to think about it um so so basically you know it's like a pyramid scheme where the uh there are the people who are producing it then the people who are following it, who, who get committed into, into spreading it. And then uh, when you try to poke a hole in it, um, 
at this point, it's difficult for people to, to, to unravel because, you know, so much of the conspiracy has become part of people's belief system um, that if you believe one conspiracy, we find that the probability that you endorse other conspiracy theories is really high. So it becomes this whole network of different conspiracies that are all related to each other. So it's a game of whack-a-mole, right? When you're trying to argue with one conspiracy, they'll just jump to a higher order conspiracy that can, can explain any inconsistencies, right? If you say, oh, you know, this isn't happening, then they'll say, oh, but the, the, the World Health Organization is involved in a new global order. And, and, you know, it becomes this sort of superordinate conspiracy that can explain all of the inconsistencies that you're finding. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a web of deception that's very difficult to, um, to unravel. And I think that's what makes them so, um, so tricky and, and also dangerous uh, in a way, um, because, you know, um, yeah, I mean, uh, some, some conspiracies are real, right? But the thing is that most people do not believe in a single conspiracy theory. It's almost never the case that you see someone who says, I've got good evidence, people are conspiring against me, and, and that's the only, you know. Uh, no, it's like COVID, climate, GMOs, everything is a conspiracy, and it's all related. That's usually what you see. Mm -hmm. Are there people with uh, particular psychological traits that are more susceptible to believing in conspiracy theories? Yeah, so we know that, um, you know, this, this sort of form of what we call magical thinking, which has to do with superstition, pseudoscience, alternative medicine, that's a huge gateway to conspiracy theories. So, it, you know, it's one thing to, uh, you know, to, to be into homeopathic medicine and stuff, and it's all fine. But, but uh, those Facebook groups are highly connected to mm -hmm. conspiracy theories about big pharma, which are highly connected to conspiracy theories uh, about vaccines and so on. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of a gateway. Um, and then also people who feel marginalized, who feel angry, uh, who are low in trust, people who are very distrustful of mainstream sources of government, uh, basically of, of everyone. Um, so paranoia, distrust, being marginalized, out of the loop, those are um, very much risk factors. And so in a way, if you want to protect people, it's important that people have a social uh, net or a network of, of people that, that they can feel trusted with that are providing accurate sources of information. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't it the case, uh, I mean, that, that uh, at least for people who, are, um, who have certain kinds of motivations to believe in certain conspiracy theories, that if you put aside certain aspects of how ridiculous it is that nobody uh, that is involved in a conspiracy is just uh, putting the truth out there, like, for example, I heard Noam Chomsky and Michael Shermer pointing to the fact that what the 9-11 truthers uh, didn't take into consideration was that if uh, it was really an inside job, then it would be really hard to believe that uh, thousands, probably millions of people who have access to that information, no one uh, had just put the truth out there, everyone had to keep their mouth shut, so that doesn't seem plausible at all. But at least some of them, sometimes, if you just look uh, at the information, it rings a little bit plausible, right? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the key thing about constructing conspiracy theories, uh, and we've done this in some experiments with colleagues, is that you, you, you leverage a grain of truth and then cast doubt on the mainstream narrative. So mm -hmm. what I show in the book is that conspiracies that are outrageous don't get any traction because they're too ridiculous. You know, mm -hmm. aliens are building pyramids. Uh, people don't care about that stuff. But if you if you leverage a grain of truth, um, then you can get traction with uh, with the conspiracy theory. So that's right. And David Grimes, who's a uh, a physicist researcher that uh, whose work I described in the book, has kind of calculated how many people it would take to keep a conspiracy secret like that, you know, that, oh, we, we didn't really land on the moon. There, there would be like, you know, 400,000 people at NASA or something like that who would have to all keep their, as you said, keep their mouths shut and, yeah. and hide this. Right? It just seems implausible mathematically. Um, and so um, that is that is quite interesting. But then, you know, people ask me about what about Epstein? Um, and so I think, you know, or, or the shooting of, of John F. Kennedy. Uh, and so the the thing is, some conspiracies sound more plausible than others, uh, and some might even be more plausible than others. But what, how it's distinguished from a scientific theory, I think, and this is the crucial part. It's not that I, you know, I think I have some special knowledge that uh, makes me the arbiter of what's a conspiracy theory or or not. It's just that 
the problem with the conspiracy theory from a purely logical point of view is that they always assume that there is some evil actor intentionally plotting something behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And that is just not a scientific assumption. You don't start with the, with the conclusion, your theory, right? And then you find evidence that fits that conclusion. You have to be open-minded. Do I know whether or not Epstein killed himself? Do I know if there was a second shooter involved with JFK? I don't know. Um, but the key thing is to be open-minded and to entertain different theories based on the best available evidence. Just assuming with your prior that there must be some evil actor plotting something, that is just completely non-scientific. And that's why I think it, it distinguishes from, from scientific theories. Mm -hmm. So there's another issue you tackle in the book that I think is very important for us to deal with here that has to do also or gets us into the distinction between debunking and pre-banking, uh, pre-banking and what works yeah. better really. So there's one issue that is, uh, so people put inf misinformation out there on the internet or elsewhere, and then there's those websites and um, sometimes on television also people try to debunk the misinformation but while they're doing it they are also exposing more people to the that piece of misinformation so uh, is there a risk that that might contribute to spreading it even more or not yeah that's a good question and i think you know what happens with with debunking the disadvantage that we're having is that you're being forced into the rhetorical frame of the person spreading the misinformation, meaning you have to repeat the misinformation in order to correct it. Yeah. Um, and that's that's not a good position to be in. Um, and so I think what you know, the consensus on that is that if you follow the best practices of debunking, then the risk is pretty low that you're spreading misinformation. But if you're not following best practices, if you're just kind of debunking in the wild, you know, randomly, then there might be some chance that you're amplifying the misinformation uh, unintentionally. And to explain that, you know, we have to sort of think about why people don't necessarily respond to corrections after the fact that well. And it has to do with, with how, you know, our memory works. And there's really two explanations, and one has to do with the... Um, what we call an integration problem. And so when you tell people that something is incorrect, then either people fail to integrate the correction into their mo mental model of how something works. Um, and so they continue to retrieve the myth, but don't integrate the correction. Or there's what we call a retrieval error, which is when people access the myth concurrently in their brain with the, with the correction, um, they're retrieving the myth, but not the not the correction. I think either way, the practical outcome is that people are accessing the myth too much uh, and not the correction when trying to think of an issue. And the reason for that is usually that the debunking is not done very well. And so in order to, to, to maximize your chances of debunking, you need to de-emphasize the myth as much as possible. So you, you can repeat it, but maybe once and briefly um, and make the correction really prominent relative to the myth. And so you, what you don't need to do is keep repeating the myth and just tell people that it's false, because then what happens is that you're strengthening the memory associations people have with the myth. And even when they tag it as false, you get lots of errors that occur during the integration and retrieval because people don't like it when you just say something is false, because then they don't know what's true instead and they can't really change their mental model of how something works. And so people mm -hmm. just revert back to their original false understanding of the issue. So you need to not only say something is false, you need to explain in detail, uh, you know, why it's false, what are the techniques used to, to do people, what's true instead. And then, you know, we, we tend to recommend this idea of the truth sandwich, uh, which, you know, research is kind of still looking into, but, but it seems like a safe way of, of doing it, which is the, the layer, you know, you start with the truth, then you explain the falsehood briefly uh, mm -hmm. and why it's wrong. Uh, and then you give people the alternative explanation and then you end again with the truth. So you layer the falsehood in two slices of truth so that you try to minimize the risk of passing on the, the falsehood. And, you know, research is still looking into all of the, the best ways of doing that, but that seems like a safe way to, to package uh, a debunking. Does that have anything to do with that idea people have that, uh, and I'm not sure if it's uh, 
if uh, in terms of scientific psychology it's true or not if it's corroborated but when people for example read the text it's easier for them to remember the beginning and the end and not so much the middle i mean does it have yeah yeah no that's a great point yeah so people have these biases called the, the primacy effect which is the first thing you hear and then the recency effect which is the last thing that you hear and so we are susceptible to that and so i think the truth sandwich implicitly plays into this idea that people are more likely to go with what they hear last or first rather than than the middle and and uh, yeah that's that's an interesting way of looking at it so you're reducing the risk that people remember the myth which is kind of in between the 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 two uh yeah um and so that's you know that that's related to um to to why we we sort of recommend that um but you know it's difficult because there are other ways of debunking that also work and so it's hard to say you know there's 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 one best way of doing it but we think that this is a, a full, using the title a foolproof way of of doing it so that it minimizes mistakes mm -hmm. Uh, and is pre-banking uh, better than debunking? And uh, if so, is it always better or does it depend on the situation? Well, I, you know, it's hard to say in terms of the scientific evidence because, you know, you, there has not been that many studies that have directly compared pre-banking and debunking. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I can't say that it, it's always better in every instance. Uh, mm -hmm. in terms of in terms of the outcomes. But what I am comfortable saying is that it's always preferable to pre bunk if you can. Um, and so, you know, even though there might be some instances in which debunking and pre bunking uh, work equally well, I think it's still preferred to try to pre bunk just because of the preemptive nature. For one, it allows you control over the framing, right? So you're not forced into the situation where you have to repeat misinformation and debunk it. You now have control over the narrative. Um, so you can preemptively try to expose people to weakened doses of, of a falsehood or the techniques used to spread misinformation um, and then refute it in advance uh, and minimize these type of risks and do it in a way that, that fits your situation and your narrative and that, that you're comfortable with. Um, and so it allows for that, for that control. But then also there's the benefit that when you pre-bunk, you minimize the risk that people store misinformation in their long-term memory because you're basically warning people in advance. So when they then come across it, uh, they're not going to integrate it into their memory because you're, you've already tagged it as false, uh, so to speak, in advance. So I think there's all of these strategic benefits to pre-bunking uh, that, are, that, are, that are nice to have. Why I, and that's why I think it's always useful to start with pre-bunking. And if that doesn't work, you can move on to debunking uh, or, or let's say real-time fact checking or real time rebuttals. And there's some nice work from um, um, Cornelia Betts and Philip Schmidt in, in Germany who show that, you know, there's often this this thing, oh don't don't feed the trolls or you know, you shouldn't you shouldn't give air to the nihilists in public because then you're just kind of giving them more uh, more attention. But what they show is that if if you just let deniers speak on radio or TV and don't do anything, then people are duped by it. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's still better to try to counter it. Um, and so, you know, pre-bunk, that doesn't work. Counter in real time. If that doesn't work, then debunk to the best extent possible. And if you have all three layers, I think we can significantly reduce the spread of misinformation mm -hmm. in society. To what extent do you think how social media platforms are structured contribute, contributes to the spreading of misinformation? Because as we know, it seems that, for example, posts, publications that are more outrageous are the ones who get more, uh, which get more attention. And uh, then social media platforms tend to promote them the most also because they need people's attention to um, generate more money to, to do to publicity and all of that. So uh, is that uh, really a, a real problem or not? I think so. Yeah. Again, it's, you know, social media research is so difficult because we're restricted in the types of data that we can publicly access. Different social media platforms have, are structured differently and they, they, the flow of information is slightly different between platforms. And so it's hard to say something that generalizes across. But, you know, one study we did do was we looked at millions of posts in both Facebook and Twitter. So we did a comparison. Um, 
And one of the things we found is that, you know, we replicated previous research that posts that are more negative get more engagement, so negative emotions. Um, but what topped the list was actually what we call out-group derogation. And so the more negative content about the other group, so if you're a liberal, then a conservative and vice versa, uh, that really got a huge amount of, uh, of engagement, much more so than just negative content by itself. And so it was really about dunking on the other side. And, you know, examples were about, you know, oh, check out Joe Biden's latest brain freeze or, you know, something like that. You know, outrageous, as you said, outrageous stuff that, that, gets the, uh, that gets engagement. And that's what we refer to as the perverse incentive structure of social media is that it rewards the type of content um, that, that so, sort of sows divisions. And, you know, that research was done during you know, so during the Trump period, but, uh, and, you know, on two different platforms, uh, but it was done in the US, which, you know, is more hyper-partisan than, than other cultures. And so, you know, there are some nuance in that um, there could be situations where um, promoting the in-group could also gain gain traction on, on social media, for example. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, but it is these mechanisms that allows information to spread uh, much further and get much more traction um, than, than you would otherwise. Uh, and certainly, sure, social media companies say, um, but people also form echo chambers and filter bubbles offline, uh, or at least echo chambers offline. And so that's, that's true. Um, if you look at where voters live, people who vote similarly live closer together. And so people segregate offline too. So social media is not the root of all evil, um, but certainly uh, social media has created a space where people can easily cluster in terms of their like-mindedness about specific topics and issues. Uh, and then that can lead to polarization uh, away uh, so that the information diet becomes more fragmented, which feeds into uh, the types of uh, low quality content that people might receive if you're stuck in an echo chamber that, you know, that is perpetuating low quality content. And then the added issue is that it impedes the spread of corrections. If the information environment is more fragmented, then broadcasting facts is not going to be as, as effective. So I think it does create lots of challenges. Mm -hmm. So when you mentioned there the US and how hyper-partisan it is in comparison to other countries, there was one question that came to my mind that I think is very important to address here as well. So uh, how cross-cultural and cross-country, let's say, is this research because i know that sometimes there's that tendency for us to focus too much on the us for example so yeah i think um you know it does uh i think we do overgeneralize findings from um from the us um you know i mean in the book i talk about examples from lots of different countries so i do i do talk about the um uh, uh referendum in spain for example between uh um, you know, basically the, uh, what are called the independents, uh, um, and, uh, uh, you know, this was about the controversy that, that Spain was having an unauthorized referendum. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there you see some of the similar dynamics play out online, that there were two, ca two camps, they were clustering away from each other. Uh, one had narratives about freedom and independence and the other, uh, and more so than the other, right? And that creates conflict in the vision. So some of that, I think, does does replicate. There's a lot of research on Russian disinformation and trolling, um, but but there's there there are definitely cross cultural nuances that are important to highlight. So, for example, one of my students, uh, Yara, is working on uh, replicating uh, some of our research in terms of the Russia uh, Ukraine conflict, and there she actually finds that it's in in terms of the uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, outlets uh, that it's much more about promoting the in group. Uh, than it is derogating the out group. Um, and so it might make sense in this, when you think about conflict, it might be important to boost morale domestically, um, right? That it's important to, uh, to, to, to what we call in-group love, right? To show cohesion and to bolster the in-group uh, as a defense against uh, uh, an attack rather than spend your resources on, on hating the other side exclusively. Um, so I think that there are nuances depending on the, on the context and the social media platform that, that you're studying. Um, um, and I think it's fair to say to the social media companies also that, you know, it's not, we all use social media, right? And so they do positive things too for people. And so it's not, they connect people and, and so on. But um, yeah, we, we do tend to focus on, on sort of situations where uh, they're contributing to division and extremism and, and, and negative recommendations. And um, some of that is happening cross-culturally, but there's also important nuances, I would say. Mm -hmm. 
Are, are echo chambers and filter bubbles really that big of a deal? Because I know there's research and evidence out there pointing to the fact that, uh, in fact, we tend to be exposed to a more varied information diet online than even many times offline. Yeah, this is a great question. And so one of the things that I try to tackle in the book is this debate between the, those who say that echo chambers are exaggerated and we're actually more exposed to diverse content online and those who say that we're all stuck in an echo chamber and we're all, we're all polarized online all the time. And I think it's really interesting when you try to figure out the answer. Part of the answer is that there was just a systematic review of this, mm -hmm. that what we call digital trace studies which look at people's online behavior. You know, they use computer models to analyze the network structure of what people are doing online. Um, and then there's the kind of more self-reported studies of what sources and media people consume. And what you find is that, you know, 99% of these digital trace studies, or let's say 90%, find clear evidence of, uh, of echo chamber or what we call homogenous clusters, so clusters of people with similar characteristics, um, whereas a lot of the self-report studies actually don't find this. And I think the difference is that they're asking a slightly different question, but we're all, we're all using the term echo chamber, but actually we mean different things. So a lot of the, the survey studies are asking the question, you know, um, what types of media diets are people consuming or what types of news are people exposed to? And then you find that people are actually exposed to a pretty diverse set of media sources and, and news, whereas the computer science type of studies, they ask the question, uh, do people who discuss a particular topic, you know, do they cluster and then polarize away from people um, on a particular platform around a specific issue. And then you find really strong evidence of echo chambers that, yeah, when you talk about abortion, vaccines, climate change, and you, you hone in on a specific issue and you look at how users interact, you see they cluster and they polarize away from each other. Um, but that's not the same as asking how broad or varied people's diet is across platforms, across issues, right? It might be the people who are on that echo chamber on that specific issue also have more diverse um, access to, to other sorts of media sources. So we're trying to find a, a good way of, of, of studying this and kind of broadening our, our definition. So I think my answer would be that, um, yes, you see that generally people have a diverse news diet but then when it interacts with social media, that's where you see most of the most of the issues, actually, that when people are discussing specific issues on social media, that's where you see the clustering and the polarization. And also, if you look at those studies that look at diversity of media content, when you break that down by the types of content that people get from social media, that's where you see most of the polarization happening. So I think what's happening is that most people sit behind the computer and if you direct browse to the BBC, if you direct browse to, to you know, um, the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal, um, you're not stuck in an echo chamber. Um, but if you're interacting with a search engine who is filtering and recommending stuff for you, or if you go on YouTube and you know you follow advertisements or you follow what's recommended for you, or if you go on social media um, and and you click on stuff, that's where it becomes trickier because you know now your your path is becoming more and more determined, uh, and you do get stuck in in echo chambers and filter bubbles. Whereas if you just look at people's media diet when they're choosing when they're when they're not part of personalized algorithms, then it's actually pretty diverse. So that's not pure causal evidence, but it does lead me to suggest that there is something about social media that is that is facilitating this. Mm -hmm. So. Uh I'm not sure if this is a silly idea or not, but at least for me personally, it never ring through that extreme version of uh, the echo chamber idea that everyone is living all the time in an echo chamber online, because it, it wouldn't make sense to me, uh, or that wouldn't explain the fact that we, it's so easy to find people particularly commenting online uh, angrily and saying that everyone is stupid because if people were just exposed to information that confirms their beliefs, then they wouldn't be calling everyone stupid and saying that everyone believes false information because they wouldn't even be exposed to that. Correct. I mean, I'm not sure if this sounds silly or not. But. No, 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 that makes a lot of sense. And so, 
you know, basically what you're saying, sometimes what we try to do is quantify the amount of cross-cutting or diverse content that people are exposed to. And then you find, especially on mainstream media, that people are actually exposed to diverse viewpoints uh, to a decent amount. Um, and so that's kind of what you're saying. People, you know, people are exposed to other viewpoints. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the definition of an echo chamber, I think it's also important to not make it too extreme. I think you can you know, what, what's likely happening is not that everyone is stuck in an echo chamber all the time, but, you know, there are echo chambers that you can get stuck in, um, but that doesn't mean that the content you receive, considering all of the media choices that you make, is 100% selective. I think that would be a kind of a very restrictive hypothesis, but it could be that the majority, that, you know, maybe 60% of the content you receive is, is echo chamber and 40% is more diverse, right? Um, and so wh where do we draw the line of what's 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 called an echo chamber and what's still diverse? And what's happening, I just did a, a piece with Rolling Stone, which is really interesting, kind of showing, sh shifting shifting the agenda now. So so on mainstream social media, where we're often talking about, okay, what, what percentage of diverse cutting content are people exposed to? And there was this mm -hmm. famous study from Facebook that showed that, well, you know, they quantified the amount that's due to the algorithm versus people's choices. And they kind of say, look, the amount of diversity in your network is just a function of how many friends you have from the other side. That, that's up to you. Um, but, you know, it's not so simple. I think if you look at if you look at the fraction that was due to the algorithm versus people's choices, they kind of make the argument that it's mostly people's choices. But I also think that, you know, people's choices interact with the algorithm because your choices are determined by what they show you. So if you factor that in, I think the algorithm determines maybe, you know, an equal amount uh, uh, in a way versus, you know, what people are choosing. So I think it's it's an interaction. Um, but, the, but, but the point is there's there is diversity in content on mainstream social media. And the point of the Rolling Stone article was to look at what's happening on alt tech platforms like Gab, Parler, Rumble. And that's where you see that, you know, there's almost no diversity in, in the content. People are exposed to extremist conspiracy theories. It's right there on the main page. People are shouting about the other side, but the other side isn't there. They're just shouting amongst themselves and they're being cut off more and more from reality. Um, and now we're sort of shifting the conversation from legacy social media, right, or mainstream social media and the alt uh, tech social media, which is now becoming more fragmented even on, on its own. Um, and so you get this interesting distinction that, yeah, maybe maybe it's better for people now to, to stay on mainstream social media because there at least there's some diversity, whereas on some of these al alternative platforms, people are completely stuck in an echo chamber. And so that's, yeah, that's been interesting. Uh, yeah, and perhaps another thing to be take, uh, uh, that we should take into account here is the fact that uh, at least according to the, uh, the evidence I've seen, many times most of the misinformation that is put out there on the internet is produced by a tiny, tiny minority of individuals and also sometimes it seems that there's lots of people also reacting to it and sharing it, but it's also statistically speaking only a minority of people doing that and all in probably the ones that are more politically motivated or have other kinds of social motivations to do it, right? Absolutely, yeah, you see this during elections, during public health emergencies, and even during uh, the, the Russian sort of disinformation campaigns uh, uh, that use trolls and, and, and bots. Mm -hmm. Most of the misinformation is produced by a small minority of accounts, the sort of hyper spreaders. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also hyper consumers of people who are extremely susceptible to consuming that information. Um, and so, um, but I think it's important to keep in mind that the hyper producers if that stuff gets retweeted either organically and it goes viral or the mainstream media gives it traction, that means that tons of people can be exposed to it, even though that it's being produced by a small minority of, um, of people. And so I think, you know, finding ways to try to contain it can still be, be challenging because even when you deplatform them, they can jump to other accounts. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's still a challenge. But yeah, certainly I think it's the, a small minority of people is responsible for most of the content. But unfortunately, you know, it can still go viral. It can still be prioritized by algorithms. It can still be amplified by the mainstream media. Um, and so that's, you know, that's the uh, that's the difficult part.
And can we be sure that misinformation really has causal power over people's behavior? Like, for example, one of the things people worry the most about is, of course, politics, voting behavior, the outcomes of elections. Uh, can we be sure that being exposed to misinformation really influences that? Yeah, it, it's, it's incredibly difficult to disentangle that. And I think the more you go towards societal issues like uh, voting and stuff, the the more intermediary processes there are that make it difficult to discern the sole causal impact of misinformation. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, you know, there are cases where the causal link is more clear. So, for example, you know, the WhatsApp mob lynchings, right? The people receive mm -hmm. false rumors on WhatsApp in India about local kidnappers or false rumors that then leads to the actual, you know, death and killing of people. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, misinformation, again, I wouldn't say that that is the sole cause, uh, right, because it also tends to be the case that there were pre-existing prejudices and pre-existing conflicts in that country, in that area, that made people maybe more susceptible to believe in that kind of misinformation. But you can at least say that misinformation has a, um, you know, a discernible role in causing direct harm. You know, people ingesting um, in Iran, for example, children and people ingesting, you know, methanol-based products to try to help cure the coronavirus. Um, you know, that's that's pretty direct in terms of misinformation and people harming themselves and others in, in public health context. Um, and so I think, you know, there's plenty of examples, I think, where you can say that there is a, a real harm of misinformation. But when you scale it up at population level and not talk about specific cases, then it becomes much more difficult. And so I think, you know, when you look at the studies that, that look at, well, can fake news or misinformation um, change the, the results of election outcomes, um, that's not entirely obvious. You know, a lot of the estimates suggest that most people during the election were not exposed to a lot of misinformation. But then you also have to, you know, be critical about, well, how accurate are our tools to estimate that, right? Most studies look at a single platform, but, you know, I'm on WhatsApp, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I talk to friends, I, I watch TV, you know, the studies, they don't take into account all of the information sources that are coming at you during an election. So we're only seeing snapshots of what people might be exposed to. But I think the bigger issue is that it doesn't account for what we increasingly see now is the, the micro targeting of misinformation. Even though misinformation may not impact most people during an election, there's now an ability to micro target misinformation at those who are most susceptible. And I think the risk is this is kind of my answer to can fake news influence elections, is that, you know, a lot of elections are decided on small margins. We're talking about a few percentage points. So you don't need to reach the whole population. If you can find out who is most susceptible to the misinformation that you're producing, and if you can target it at them through social media or other channels in a way that's, that makes it more efficient in the sense that people are more likely to be persuaded because it's personalized, um, then you can still undermine uh, democracy and elections um, with that process. And we've, we have seen some of that um, during, you know, during whether it was the, the presidential election or Brexit, some of our, our previous events. And it is debated because we don't know exactly what happened. But we have seen more and more studies coming out now showing that micro-targeting can work in the context of political events. Um, and so that I think that is particularly concerning. Mm -hmm. So in the interest of time, because I know we're running out of time here, let's get into uh, inoculation as you talk about it in the book, because you establish an interesting uh, analogy between our biological immune system and what would be sort of a psychological information immune system. So what uh, inoculation techniques are out there? Yeah, so the basic premise of inoculation is that just as with vaccines, you inject people with a weakened dose of a pathogen or an inactivated strain to try to trigger the production of antibodies to help infer resistance against future infection. And it turns out you can do the same with misinformation by exposing people to a weakened dose of a falsehood and refuting it in advance or the techniques that are used to spread misinformation and neutralizing them. People can build up cognitive or intellectual antibodies so that they're more immune when they actually come across misinformation in the future. Um, and there's various ways that you could do that. You could have uh, what we call an issue-based or a fact-based pre-bunk or inoculation, which is that you, know, you have a specific falsehood, you synthesize a weakened dose of that uh, using humor or other ways to, to weaken it and give people a snapshot, then you refute that specific myth um, with the facts in advance, 
uh, and then you can make people more immune to a specific falsehood, so the issue-based. Um, or you have what we call the sort of the techniques-based, the technique-based inoculation, um, which is more of a broader spectrum vaccine. So the idea here is that you actually inoculate people, not against a specific falsehood or issue, but a larger technique. So one example could be conspiracy theories in general. So you expose people um, to the building blocks of what a conspiracy is, how they're constructed, and then you actually test people. In our experiments, we test people and we, we, we show them a range of conspiracy theories, and we find that people become relatively more immune, regardless of the content of the specific conspiracy. So it's more of a broad spectrum type of vaccine. And there's trade-offs between the two, right? If you're broad, in terms of the technique, you can't be certain that you protect people against every single example, but you know that there's some broader immunity. If you want to be highly specific and give a high amount of immunity to one specific falsehood, then you can go with the sort of issue-based inoculation. Um, and then there's all kinds of varieties around passive versus active. So you can, you can give people the inoculation and they can internalize it, or you can do it actively and let people generate their own antibodies, which we do in a lot of our interventions. So we produce simulated social media environments and games and quizzes and animated videos where um, you know people can explore on their own and, and build resistance that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so just one last question. Would the concept of herd immunity also apply here? I mean, is it that by inoculating yourself, you can also help inoculate uh, your friends, your family, your community and so on? Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, one of the ideas behind this was that, oh, it's interesting that you can inoculate people at an individual cognitive level. But if you really follow the analogy, then the, the ultimate goal really is herd immunity, right? That's the whole point of, of real vaccination. And so we're hoping to do the same with psychological um, inoculation, that if enough people are inoculated psychologically, misinformation won't have a chance to spread. And, and that factors in two important components. One is that we can't reach everyone with inoculation. Some people People might, as they are hesitant about vaccines, they might be hesitant about psychological vaccines, right? Um, some people are hard to reach. Um, and uh, But we don't need to vaccinate everyone, just a critical threshold so that misinformation in the community, so that misinformation is, is less likely to spread. And we've started doing some computer simulations to see what happens um, and whether that's feasible. And one of the interesting things we found is that if you assume an, uh, an, a world where there's agents interacting with each other and there's broadcasters of misinformation, um, that if people have strong you know, prior beliefs and they're stuck in a, a social media kind of network structure and there's people with, with misinformation broadcasting at them, then if you inoculate a little bit at a time you know, throughout the, the period, then you know, there's, that's useful on the margins. But what really is the most useful is if you inoculate the population up front heavily beforehand and that's you know obviously also consistent with the with the analogy and that's where you can get most you know most traction is by really preemptively building resilience and that's why we're stressing that to governments and social media companies and the public and and other organizations that the most efficient way of doing this is just by building preemptive resilience against future disinformation Okay, great. So I will leave the rest of the information to people read about in the book. Of course, we can't just uh, put it all here on the table in this interview. But uh, the book is again foolproof why misinformation infects our minds and how to build immunity. I will be leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview. So and uh, apart from the book, where can people find you online and your work? Yeah, I'm on uh, still on Twitter for the moment. So people uh, can find me at uh, Sander underscore VD Linden. Um, my website, SanderVanderLinden.com. Um, or if they just uh, uh, Google my name and Cambridge University, some things should, uh, should come up. Okay, great. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show, for writing the book, which was a great read. And it's always a great pleasure to have you on. Likewise. Thanks so much. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting it on Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description box of this interview. And if you like this interview, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. 
I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Karen Litzka, Anne Blanchett, Perga, Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Herbert Gintis, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Calenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegar, Rui Inácio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Cavana, Jorge Pinha, Michael Stormier, Samuel Andrea, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Alexander Dan Bauer, Fergal Cusson, Harl Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Leibrandt, John Nyar, Stand. Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tom Hummel, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassil Adez Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punta, Radan Arzmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pablo Stazewski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Saima Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Doug, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzka, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Buddhafi, Sunny Smith, John Wisman, Morton Eichland, Dr. Bird, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Mau Maria, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Lowacki, Giorgio Stéphanus, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Ruth Towell, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Pedro Bonilla, Ziegler, João Barbosa, Bangalore Atheists, Larry D. Lee Jr., Old Herrigman, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Gracies, Tom Roth, D. RPMD and Eager N. And special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Tom Vanagdam, Bernard Igni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Miller, Vega Giddy, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Al Nick Ortiz, and to my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.